Well, welcome tonight to our webinar on green cleaning. We have two wonderful speakers. Our first speaker up will be Kristen Clark, who's gonna talk about uh, all natural cleaners. And then we have Christine Harper from Clark County Public Health, who's gonna talk to us about disinfecting and sanitizing, which especially given these days uh, with COVID is a really important subject. So we appreciate both of them coming and spending their evenings with us. So without any further ado, Kristen Clark, a master compost recycler, just like all of you in training. You are more than welcome. So sorry, I don't have a working camera tonight. Um, so but like you said, my name is Kristen Clark. I've been in MCR since the class of 2015. Um, I originally got into green cleaning because of my children. Three out of the four of my children have skin allergies. So having children who are very sensitive to those kind of things, I had to figure out another way to make products to clean my house without harming my children in the process. So that is how I got started down the green cleaning lane. Um, and one of the things that some of you have heard that I want to tell everybody is that every product here works really, really well. My husband's only requirement for green cleaning was that the product had to work as good or better than what is on the market. And everything here works better than what's on the market. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to create a healthier home. And since we're all home, <laughs> this is a great time to learn how to keep it clean, how to um, make it a little healthier, and just have some fun with it. So, and we're going to teach you exactly how to clean it, which, what each product does and how you can actually use it to actually remove dirt, grime, and other residues. So the products I'm going to give you do not sanitize. So I want that point to be clear. These products clean, they do not sanitize. That's a whole different section of life. The CDC, the first thing they tell you to do is always to clean your home. Somebody throws up, you clean. Somebody's sick, you clean. If somebody gets a flu, what do you do? You clean the handles and everything people typically touch. The first thing you always do is clean. So that's what these products are gonna do. Next slide. Okay, it's not only about us, but it's also about our environment. So if you look at a lot of what is in products today, yes, it gets your dishes wonderfully clean and yes, it gets your windows perfectly clean and no, you don't have to put any elbow grease into it. Whereas baking soda, vinegar, a little bit of soap, not so bad, but a lot of the chemicals and if you look at the back of bottles, there's a lot of them on there. You kind of see how they can disrupt an environment like the poor little frogs, you know, you know, it destroys the mucus layer that protects the, all of our aquatic creatures. So we have to be careful of our water because not only do creatures have to live there that support our life, but this is also the water that we have to drink. Does anybody have what looks like the shelf in their house? So typically though, if you look at the shelf, you see we got Drano on the left, we're cleaning our carpets. Let's see, we got some so safer soft scrub, soft scrub cleaner clean the windows oh we got two types of windows we got there is everything and anything so the question is is you got to ask yourself what really is in those cleaners and if you take one of those bottles and we all have them around the house or you might have them around the house but and you look at them it's a laundry list of things that you cannot necessarily know what they are unless you either google it or you have a degree in chemistry and that's where these products come from and that's one of the one things that you have to think about is if you go through your house and just take a minute and think about it, think about all those cleaners. Every time you get them out, how many exposures you'll have to them, how many exposures to each of them that your family has in each and every single room. Because a lot of people will only think of like, like one room, but think about how many exposures are in your dining room plus your kitchen and then your living room and then your garage and then and it's a collective whole that people kind of need to think about, not just one isolated event when you're holding one specific cleaner. Because as you go through this, you can see, and we're all used to seeing these labels, you either see a red, a green, or an orange. So the safer ones that you see down here at the bottom, those we're talking about tablespoonfuls. The less hazardous ones, we're talking about a teaspoonful. And the highest hazardous ones, we're talking drops. That is when they say it's danger 
poison if swallowed. High as hazard can be a couple of drops in that product can do some serious damage. So um, a case in point for this is my youngest daughter was, she's 11 and we had those little um, pods for the dishwasher and she got one drop from one of the pods, it got into her eye and for 24 hours she could not see color out of her eye from the chemicals that were in that pod. So let that sink in for a minute. Now we wash our dishes with this stuff. And that's what happened to her eye. She ended up getting it flushed four times, but she's fine now. So the products that we're going to be learning about tonight and using are in the green area. Okay. Because we want to keep it as safe as possible. So that way, if something were to happen, there's a less likely chance of doing permanent irreparable harm to a person. Okay. So if we're looking at these, you can see like here on the left, the liquid drain cleaner, it contains caustic soda. Um, that is highly, highly acidic. It, you can see how their eye irritants here on the right with the bright clean. Why would you all clean with this stuff? I forgot this stuff is on the market. Sorry. It has its active ingredients. Does anybody have a degree in chemistry to know what dimethyl benzyl ammonium chlorides are? I mean, it's a, bleach of some kind. But when you look at the back of these and you see, you know, you want to do not induce vomiting here on the left with the drain opener, because that would actually make it worse. If it gets in your eye, you need to flush it with the water for at least 15 minutes. And they mean 15 minutes straight. They don't mean like 15 seconds. So these are the things that can sit around your house and you can have problems with. Next slide. Ah, my favorite. Green washing. Yes, green washing. Marketing and branding is a very powerful tool and people use it. I don't want to vilify it because it should not be vilified, but at the same time, you need to be very aware of what they're doing. If you look at Greenworks, it's a very pretty flower. It's green. Green is a very loving, environmentally friendly color. It's non-toxic. There are a lot of things that are non-toxic that still are not necessarily environmentally friendly or it's eco-friendly or it's biodegradable or it's eco-safe. These are all words to make you feel good to elicit an emotion from you to purchase a product. It is not necessarily directly related to the product in it. Okay. If you want to know what you're looking for and you want to know that the product you're buying is truly a solid product, look at one of these four designs. Okay. Safer choice. On safer choice, what the company does is they take their product they take all the information, they hand it to the EPA and say, tell the people that, yes, this is a safe product for you to purchase, to use, to have in your home, and that it's fine. Okay. And the EPA says, okay. And then they give it this label. So these are the ones that you want to see. Oh, fragrances. Okay. So the beauty about fragrances is that they don't have to tell you what's in it ever. Those are considered um, safeguarded. They are copyrighted. They are just there to make it. They can use the most toxic, the most volatile, the most god-awful chemicals ever to make it smell like beautiful roses on a rainy day. But because it's copyrighted and because it is patented, they don't have to tell you what's in it. So that is one of the things that when you see the word fragrance, you have to be very careful about what's in it because a lot of times they won't tell you. And it is cheaper to make a fragrance out of petroleum based products that are horrible for the person, but great on their bottom line to put in their products. Um, there's an interesting documentary called Stink that if you want to see more on fragrances and how they work, so you can explore that more. Okay, so here's what my green cleaning list looks like. Yep, that's everything. Okay, so we got borax here on the left. Super washing soda. Oh, and borax and super washing soda can be found in the laundry aisle. 
They are either on the lower shelves or the upper shelves, but never in the middle. Super washing soda is, I want to say it's a single carbonate. You cannot make super washing soda in the oven, no matter how hard you try. That does not work. And Arm & Hammer is probably the predominant one I've seen on the market. Baking soda is next to it. They are not the same ingredients. Super washing soda is a single carbonate. Baking soda is bicarbonate. So they are two separate items. Okay, we got bar castile. Sometimes you just use that. I am in the upper right here, the liquid castile. That will be what we use predominantly for all of our cleaners. Now, liquid castile soap is technically olive oil soap made in Castile, Spain. They have since used just vegetable oil soap. So if you want to get, not Dr. Bronner's, no offense to him, um, like say uh, a off brand or like a store brand, totally fine. And then white vinegar. So recently on the market, Heinz came out with cleaning vinegar. The cleaning vinegar, which now has a new name, is a 6% acidity versus your traditional white vinegar, which is a 5% acidity. You want to use regular white vinegar. If you use like an apple cider vinegar, it can actually discolor some stuff. You don't want to use the balsamic vinegars because they're not as acidic. Okay, and please understand with any vinegars, over time, if you have like on a table, like my table, we have a polyurethane coating, it will take off the coating slowly. But that is something to think about depending on the furniture that you have. Okay, so we are going to make the all-purpose cleaner tonight, the window cleaner tonight, and the safer scrubber tonight. Okay, the safer scrubber would be equivalent to like a soft scrub. And there isn't anything, I'm trying to think, there isn't anything I can't clean with all, with one of these three things. Um, the window cleaner, I will say, if you clean your windshields with it, will get it so clear that you can't see the glass. So that's a little dis disconcerting when you drive. I was very happy when the bug finally splat so I could see it. Um, there isn't anything so far. I use a safer scrubber on my glass top. Um, I use it on burnt stuff in my pans. The all-purpose cleaner I actually now use in my toilets and all over everything. And they are very, very easy to make. Very easy to make, very easy to keep around. And the cool thing is, is because you have the parts, if you run out at like, you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, because you're cleaning at that time for whatever reason, maybe a company's coming over tomorrow and you run out, you can just quickly make it right after that. It's just downright cheap to make it yourself. And that's the part that's always cracked me up because commercial products are 95% water and you pay for the pretty label and about 5% of ingredients. So if you look at the all-purpose cleaner, this is what you're you're paying for. Three cups of water, a teaspoon of super washing and soda, uh, two tablespoons of white vinegar, two tablespoons of vegetable oil soap, and a spray bottle. And now you're paying 44 cents. A whole 44 cents. And it does work on countertops, walls, where work. Um, I have applied it to the paint on my walls. I've applied it to Sharpie. With the Sharpie, I had to use safer scrubber. The only thing I would be careful with are granite and marble countertops if you have those in your house. Uh, test those in a very small area because I know that white vinegar and granite don't like each other. <clears throat> Window cleaner. Ooh, I'm down to 38 cents. And it cleans all kinds of glass. It is really, oh, for the record, the cornstarch that you see in here when everybody's like, why is it in there? It actually absorbs oils off of, um, off of the window. So it took me a long time to figure that one out, but it was like, no, it's in there because it actually will absorb oils off of things. So as you can see, we haven't hit a dollar yet for how much it costs for you to make these things. Next slide. Okay, save for scrubber. Let's see, I've scrubbed my tub. I've scrubbed my toilets, scrubbed my countertops, uh, Sharpie marker, glass tops, burnt on food. Oh, headlights, I've scrubbed headlights with it and it works really well. Um, so yeah, so if you're having a hard time getting something off, save for scrubber. I haven't found something yet that I, I can't get with it. 
Okay, so while we're sitting right here, I do want to talk about a couple of things when making these. One, oil soap and vinegar don't like each other. Any kind of soap does not like vinegar. They just, they, they don't have a good relationship. However, they have an amazing relationship with an intermediary like water. So what you need to do is make sure you add one, like say the vinegar, then the water, and then the soap, and then they can mix with themselves. If you pour direct vinegar onto any kind of soap, it will unsaponify or no longer be soap. So I do wanna make that point when you're making any of these products. Okay, these are your resources with like household waste information, um, sending, getting rid of anything that you currently have in your house, um, information on living a healthier life. There are also a lot of books that are currently in the library that actually do talk about this information and they have other versions. Some work well, some don't. And then I have not been to healthdata.gov, but it's a probably a really good database on the information about each of the products that are out there on the market. Um, I live on a septic and well. Are these cleaners safe for septic? I live on septic and well too, and they're great. Cool. Haven't had one problem. Sweet. And there are six of us. Scented uh, Dr. Yeah, scented Dr. Bronner's. That's fine. That's a personal choice. Um, scents are personal choice. Dr. Bronner's is more typical essential oils than they are actual scents per se, the last time I checked. So I'm thankful for this opportunity. Um, there might be a little bit of overlap between me and Kristen's presentation, but it doesn't hurt to hear it twice. Um, in public health, our work is, is focused on protecting and improving the health of and the environment for the people who live in our community. Um, environmental public health focuses on preventing and mitigating public health impacts from pathogens and disease that are spread through the water, air, food, and the built environment. This includes the healthy home environment. The two go hand in hand. Um, before we get into how cleaning practices can help uh, keep you healthy, let's let's kind of review how germs cause uh, disease and how they're spread. So germs are tiny organisms or living things that cause disease. There are four main types of germs, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoa. These germs enter our bodies in different ways. The amount of germs that enter our bodies will determine if and how sick we get. Some germs enter our bodies by eating food that is contaminated with bacteria, viruses, or parasites, such as E. coli, salmonella, hepatitis A, just to only name a few. We have our waterborne illnesses where we drink water that is contaminated, such as with a parasite called Giardia. We also can get waterborne illnesses from swimming in pools or natural bodies of water, such as lakes and rivers. Um, we become ill if we inhale respiratory droplets from a sick person's coughs and sneezes. Uh, this can happen through close distance exposure, like with COVID-19, or through airborne diseases like measles that can stay suspended and contagious in the air for up to two hours after the sick person has left the room. Contaminated surfaces and the focus of this presentation can also be a source of germs entering our bodies and making us sick. When we touch surfaces that are contaminated and then touch our eyes, nose, or mouth with our dirty hands or eat without washing our hands first, we risk putting the germs into our bodies. By understanding how germs can enter our bodies, we can take practical steps to prevent the spread within our homes, and this starts with safe and effective cleaning. So when talking about cleaning, I first want to mention the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, because these are often um, misused. Cleaning is the process of removing dirt, debris, and germs from a surface. The process of cleaning removes most germs from our surfaces, in fact, up to 99% of our germs can be removed with good cleaning using soap, water, and a microfiber cloth. Sanitizing is reducing the remaining germs on a clean surface up to 99.9%. It is meant to target the bacteria that may still be remaining on the surface after cleaning. Disinfecting is destroying or inactivating the germs on a clean surface, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses.
to start, um, let's look at cleaning because cleaning should always be the, the first step. Germs get transferred and stuck onto surfaces by contaminated dirt and oil coming into contact with the surface, such as from our hands or from some foods. Cleaning works by removing this dirt and oil that contain and protect the germs. Cleaners, soaps, and detergents work by breaking down the dirt and oil and making it easily removed from the surface with wiping and rinsing. When the dirt and oil are removed, the germs go with it. In the store, you will see lots of different products labeled for cleaning. These products are not necessarily any more effective at removing germs than a simple homemade soapy water solution. A soap and water mixture is a safe and effective cleaner. To make your own, and I know we had some other recipes, um, but here's another simple one. Uh, mix one teaspoon of a fragrance-free soap in a spray bottle with water. Spray it directly onto your surface and using a microfiber cloth, creating friction and some soap suds on the surface, uh, really start to break down the oil and lift the dirt up. Then rinse off any remaining soap residue using a clean, wet rag. And this is all that is needed to really break down that dirt and remove 99% of the germs. The health department recommends against using an antibacterial soap, both for cleaning and for washing hands. Antibacterial soap is not necessary and it can be harmful for our health. For example, antibacterial products create stronger antibiotic resistant bacteria by killing off the weak and letting the strong survive. Additionally, some chemicals and antibacterial soap can be harmful to your health and the health of the environment. Just a fragrance free Castile soap is gonna be safer for you and for the environment. For most areas in your home, just cleaning with soap and water is, is enough and all you need to do. Um, but when it comes to sanitizing and disinfecting, only using products registered with the EPA is what uh, is recommended. The, the reason is that the EPA registr registered products, they meet a certain standard for performance. If we are trying to sanitize or disinfect, we need a product that is truly doing that. And that EPA registration is going to approve the product for that use. After cleaning with soap and water, sanitizing may be appropriate. Next step, in your home, areas that would benefit from sanitizing include kitchens, um, services that come into contact with food, or children's toys and pacifiers that they put into their mouth. Most importantly, uh, only use a sanitizer that is stated to be safe for food contact surfaces. This will be on the label instructions. Different foods can introduce harmful bacteria during food preparation that can lead to foodborne illness. For example, cooking with raw meat can introduce harmful bacteria such as salmonella or E. coli into our kitchen or onto our food preparation surfaces. To prevent foodborne illness when preparing raw meat, counters, cutting boards, and utensils, they need to be washed with soap and rinsed and then sanitized. If you have a dishwasher at home, the dishwasher will do the sanitizing step for you. For items that can't fit in the dishwasher, such as cutting boards and the counters, um, then using a sanitizer after cleaning with soap and water will reduce any lingering bacteria on the food preparation surface to a safe level. The sanitizer you are using should state, again, that it's approved for kitchens or food contact surfaces. It is also worth mentioning that we are seeing more outbreaks and illness from our store-bought produce due to how we grow, process, and handle our food. The United States has had multiple E. coli outbreaks over the last few years linked back to contaminated produce. One outbreak in particular came from lettuce that was grown in an area too close to farm livestock fields. The cow's manure contaminated stream that ran downhill into the fields that grow the lettuce. The lettuce was then mishandled by not being properly washed this introduced E. coli into homes across the country that caused illness, hospitalizations, and death. Again, washing is the first step to removing germs that cause illness. It is recommended that all produce should be thoroughly rinsed in your home before consuming it, even when the packaging states it's already washed and ready to eat. Um, taking that extra step to do a good produce rinse and reduce 
will reduce the potential of introducing harmful germs into your body and your home. Place your produce in a colander and rinse under running water and use some agitation to break up the dirt and then rinse that dirt down the drain. Um, and that will uh, give you a nice good step to prevent some of those bacteria from entering your body. The use of disinfectants is important, uh, but it does have a time and place to be used. Most often it is not necessary in our homes with the exception of high risk areas, high touch surfaces, or areas exposed to someone with an infectious disease. A high touch surface would be doorknobs, light switches, refrigerator handles, faucet sinks, and keyboards. Restrooms are considered a high risk area in the home due to the risk of fecal contamination, and it should be regularly clean and disinfected. Um, in the restroom, we shed different germs in the process of going to the bathroom. Without good hand washing after wiping, we can spread poop on our hands to our touch surfaces. A single gram of human feces, uh, which is about the weight of a paper clip, can contain one trillion germs. Restrooms are also a place that ill people go. For example, if someone is ill in your home with norovirus, they are going to experience about 24 hours of vomiting and diarrhea. During this time, that ill person is shedding the norovirus to the bathroom. People with norovirus illness can shed billions of norovirus particles, and it only takes just a few particles to make someone sick. If that ill person touches a doorknob, a sink, or a handle without good hand washing, which is easy to do when you're not feeling well, um, then the norovirus can be passed onto a surface and live there for up to two hours. If someone else in your household then touches one of these dirty services and then puts their hands in their eyes, nose, or mouth, or eats without proper hand washing, then norovirus can spread to that person. Norovirus is easy to spread within a household for this very reason. If someone is sick in your home with diarrhea and vomiting or and or vomiting, uh, then cleaning the bathroom with soap and water and then coming back through with a disinfectant would be an appropriate time to use a disinfectant in the home. It's important to note uh, that disinfectants, they do not remove the germs. They simply destroy the germs that they come into contact with. So this is why cleaning is important and should be the first step. Many products, they're a sanitizer and a disinfectant. And the difference is in the concentration of the solution that is being applied. A milder concentration will sanitize where a stronger concentration is going to do the disinfecting. The instructions on how to properly mix these solutions will be on the product label instructions. Always follow the label instructions for safe use, concentration, and the contact time. The contact time is the time it, it, that is needed to kill the germs on our surface at that given concentration of the disinfecting solution. So if the instructions on the bottle say to leave the surface wet, visibly wet, for up to five minutes, or sorry, <laughs> to leave the disinfectant on the surface visibly wet for five minutes, but you only leave it wet for three minutes, then you're not completing the step and you're therefore you're not properly destroying the germs. In most areas of your home, soap and water are enough to remove those germs to safe level. The frequency of how often you should disinfect your home, it really just depends on your personal home environment. Overusing disinfectants or these products does not provide any additional protection and can just expose you to harmful chemicals. Um, the disinfectants that we see on the shelves commonly contain hazardous chemicals. Um, people using these products or people around these products as they're being used, they can get sick or develop illnesses. Um, disinfectants contain chemicals that can be irritating to your lungs and can trigger an asthmatic attack. They also can uh, contain endocrine disrupting chemicals, which can interfere with your hormonal system and reproductive health. And some studies have linked the exposure to these ingredients to cancer. There also can be damage to the skin and eyes if you were to spill it on yourself or splash it. And children are more susceptible to those types of exposures. It's important to um, 
use disinfectants properly. So when applying a disinfectant, do not fog, spray, fumigate, or mist the chemicals into the air. The chemical industry is, uh, they push a lot of these spray options and spray products because of their quick and easy use. Um, commercials and different advertisements show the use of these products in a way that is not recommended even by their own label instructions. It, so it can be harmful uh, to inhale the chemicals. Uh, for this reason, the CDC recommends using a liquid disinfectant product with a cloth to wipe down your surfaces as the best way. So deciding what sanitizing or disinfecting products to use can be confusing uh, since there are so many options and catchy labels and advertisements that make it hard for someone to decide the best choice. Um, be cautious of the attempts to greenwash your product. So again, greenwashing is that creative advertising that shows a product is good for the environment to increase sales. When shopping um, for cleaning, sanitizing, or disinfecting products, you see the labels that say green, all natural, or non-toxic. These terms are not regulated, so they don't necessarily mean anything. In fact, uh, researchers have found that products labeled as green often have just as many toxic chemicals in them as conventional cleaning products. With cleaning products, the ingredients do not have to be listed on the label, and the manufacturers don't have to prove that they are safe before marketing them to you. Disinfectants only have to list the active ingredients that kill the germs. So with all of these things to know, it makes it really hard for the consumer to pick the best option. Um, even with the intention of trying to pick the safest option, the product labeling, label design can be very misleading. So to find a product that meets a safer standard for you and the environment, we can look at that third party certification label. So the product's labeled with the safer choice, the green seal, eco logo, or designed for the environment, they meet a higher standard that they are safer for humans and the environment. The design for the environment label is the strictest in the criteria for the environment. One thing you can do uh, when searching for a product is to look at the active ingredients um, labeled on the bottle. Look for the active ingredients that are safer for those with asthma, such as hydrogen peroxide, isopropyl alcohol, and lactic acid. Um, these active ingredients are better for indoor air quality. Um, there was a question about hydro hydrogen peroxide. So for hydrogen peroxide, um, when you're if you're wanting to use that as your sanitizer or disinfectant, you need to um, purchase a product with that EPA registered number with hydrogen peroxide as the active ingredient. It's not the same hydrogen peroxide that you would get from the first aid aisle. So um, make sure that it's going to be a an approved sanitizer or disinfectant with that active ingredient listed. But when it comes to isopropyl alcohol, at least 70%, um, you can use that um, in your household for your high touch surface cleaning. I like to use that, it was mentioned on electronics. Um, I use that for my keyboard, my cell phone, um, my light switches. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it on your counters just because it's kind of very stinky when you initially spray it, um, but it does evaporate quickly. Um, so just really finding the product that works best for you with the ingredients that, that uh, you trust and, um, and looking for those third-party labeling to help assist you in your decision. So regardless how safe a disinfectant product is marketed, it's important to always read and follow the label to ensure that you're using it safe and effectively. Always protect yourself, uh, wear gloves, and consider eye protection for accidental splashing or spilling, and ensure you have good ventilation. Um, open the windows if possible and get some airflow. If you have other people in the household, especially children, keep them away from the area that's being sanitized or disinfected to reduce exposure. When mixing a solution, follow the label exactly to ensure that the right concentration is being made, and avoid mixing incompatible incompatible chemicals, um, because that alone can be very dangerous. Um, for example, ammonia and bleach creates a deadly toxic gas. So uh, just making sure you're following those label instructions when you're mixing solutions. Um, store chemicals uh, in a locked cabinet or above children where they can reach or access from pets. Um, 
ensure all bottles and containers are labeled with the content, um, including your own cleaning solutions that you make. Um, even if you know what's in a solution, it, if a child were to access it and swallow or spill it, being able to refer to the label to know what's in that container is really important in helping that child. So even if it's your own solution, throw a label on there so that everybody knows what, what that product is. And disinfectant wipes. Um, they deserve their own slide due to how prevalent they are in our daily life. Um, disinfectant wipes, especially this year, have become a staple. Um, you can see them in stores, restaurants, and, and places of work. Um, they're advertised as a quick and easy way to wipe your counters down and go on with your business. Um, however, disinfectant wipes are rarely used in a way that is effective. Um, just like other disinfecting products we just talked about, the surface must be cleaned first before applying a disinfectant. Additionally, the contact time or the time it takes to destroy the germs on the surface can be anywhere from four to 10 minutes. This means that the surface has to remain visibly wet for that full length of time to actually disinfect. The disinfectant wipes when used will evaporate quickly off the surface. So in order to keep the surface wet, you have to do multiple wipes. The wipes can also dry out and the concentration of the disinfectant decreases after opening the container. Disinfectant wipes also have an environmental impact. Um, the production of the wipes requires water and creates waste. Um, it also is a single use item. So after using it one time, it goes to a landfill. Um, disinfectant wipes can also contain those same harmful chemicals we talked about um, in the other disinfecting products. Um, and of course, if handling, you should wear gloves or wash your hands immediately after. Um, if you have to do a quick cleanup, just using soap and water is, is a great option for that. So with an increased interest in green cleaning and reducing uh, exposure to chemicals, um, many people are making their own cleaning solutions at home, which is excellent. Um, but through this, we are seeing an increased use in essential oils. Um, so what smells make you think of clean? Uh, is it pine from pine salt or, or lemon fresh? We, these smelling nice, um, it has a nostalgic quality um, and essential oils and fragrances, they, they could give you that, but they also can contribute to poor indoor air quality um, and can lead to some health issues, especially for someone who is sensitive, such as with allergies or asthma. Um, some essential oils, they can be sensitizers, and with sensitizers, the more exposure we have, the more sensitive we become to them. Something to consider when making a product is creating a scent-free environment. So having scents added to the room is not necessary. If a room is clean, there shouldn't really be a smell to mask. So before trying to cover up a smell, try to find the source and eliminate it. So for a quick review, making your own cleaning solution is quick and easy. It is better for the environment by reducing your footprint. It's safer for our health by improving indoor air quality and reducing our exposure to chemicals. Um, and it can save you money. Lastly, I want to point out that regardless if we have germs all over our hands from touching dirty services, either in our home or out in the world, we can still prevent germs from entering our bodies by washing our hands before eating or touching our eyes, nose, or mouth. Good hand washing is our best defense against germs. So wet your hands first, scrub with soap for 20 seconds, uh, rinse the germs down the drain, and then dry your hands. Um, it's a very effective against bacteria and viruses, even against the coronavirus. The soap actually breaks down the structure of the virus and makes it easy to rinse and remove from your hands. Stopping the spread of germs is important for your health, for your family's health, and the health of the community. So when you first get home, wash your hands right away and wash your hands frequently throughout the day. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth, and always wash your hands before you eat. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue or your elbow, and stay out of other people's spit zones to prevent inhaling another person's respiratory droplets, so think that physical distancing. Um, work towards good ventilation, whether that's opening windows or using an air cleaner or improving your home filtration. Um, and stay home when you're sick. And when I say sick, I'm coughing, sneezing, fever, diarrhea, or vomiting. 
and uh, support public health by keeping yourself and your family uh, safe and healthy. And lastly, um, just be an advocate for our beautiful environment. Thank you. Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, I, so I also buy the t-shirts and use them. Um, so you, you can, yeah, it's really a, a rag um, is, is totally fine. The microfiber um, cloth is, a, is a, a CDC recommendation and that comes from a, strictly a public health perspective and that it's just better at, at cleaning. Um, it has, it has uh, the way that the, the cloth material is made, it has a little bit of static, so it lifts uh, some dust and dirt and also just how it's firmer, so it gives some good friction when you're scrubbing. Um, so to get that 99 point or 99% of germs removed, that, that that is with a microfiber cloth, not with a normal like, towel or rag. Um, so if you're using something other than a microfiber cloth, just know that just do some extra scrubbing with some additional soap. Uh, Christine, the straight 70% isopropyl alcohol, that can work in just a spray bottle as a sanitizer with, with the right length of time, set time? Yeah, so um, it will, that's where that EPA registration comes in. So on the product label, it will tell you how long to leave it on your surface. Um, but the, with, with rubbing alcohol, the isopropyl, it, um, it will evaporate at its own time. So if it's at least 70%, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about that contact time. If you're doing a good, you know, soap and water clean first, and then putting that alcohol at 70% um, or higher will will be fine. So we'll just click on the first one, which is a Clorox 409 cleaner, and it gets a D rating. And so there's moderate concern for asthma, skin allergies, um, developmental and reproductive toxicity, which doesn't sound good. And it's some there's some concern for the environment. Um, it lists the ingredients. So this alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium chlorides <laughs> receives an F. Um, it does have isopropyl alcohol, which is not too bad, and potassium hydroxide. But I think this stuff, all these chemicals, kind of tips it over. So it's kind of fun to use. I the, Earlier I was t typing in the dishwasher stuff. And like Christine mentioned, there's, um, I think seventh generation came up. I think I've used this eco stuff before and it's pretty good and it's good at cleaning. And so there's a really awesome recommendations just for alternatives as well to your typical cleaners. So that's ewg.org. And then this is the guide to healthy cleaning where you can search any kind of product that you might come across. Um, sure, I just, um, I was raised in a Puerto Rican uh, kitchen so we always boil water after we cook and uh pretty much just run that over um all of our like cutting boards our plates our pans um as a sanitizing um, mechanism so i was just curious if that was kind of um just thoughts on that um, so using heat to sanitize, um, the temperature would have to be at least 165 degrees um, for at least 15 seconds to properly sanitize. So um, if, if that's accomplishing that, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't sh won't be sure. Um, but I, what I will say is um, really only certain things in your kitchen need to be sanitized after. So um, if it, you know, pots and pans, a good soap and water and rinse out um, will be fine just because you use they, the pots themselves get hot when you're cooking with them and like that so um, really it's just those surfaces that are coming in contact with you know produce and raw meat um, that you're really wanting to do that sanitized step the rest soap and water is, is effective 